the history of Canada, certain events are always highlighted and are well enshrined in our collective memory. Be it the War of 1812, the Battle of Vimy Ridge, the creation of Canada in 1867, or the 1972 Summit Series. However, there is so much more to our history and the history of the land before Canada existed. This podcast endeavors to tell those stories, looking at chapters of our history that may be regionally well-known, but not necessarily well-known nationwide. And while much of the history of Canada is solidly rooted in fact, there are a number of stories which leave more questions than answers. There is a part of the history of Canada, even the land before Canada as a country existed, where there are mysteries, legends, myths, and stories that shiver the soul. And these stories are just as important as the ones we all know about. And we will be telling some of those stories today. Welcome to Canadian History After Dark. Witchcraft, trials, and executions. Bringing up the subject in Canada harkens an image from the United States, the Salem Witch Trials. Those cases were just a portion of the more than 300 cases that were tried in New England during the 17th century. These trials came about from a number of things. The fear of witches and the unknown, anti-intellectualism, a desire to get rid of those who were considered undesirable in the community, revenge, and more. The surge of witchcraft trials and executions in New England was part of a phenomenon seen throughout much of the Western world. After all, there were witchcraft trials and executions in Britain, France, and many other countries. Given that information, it could easily be thought that there were similar things that happened in Canada. But in our collective memory, not much is there. Which leads to the question, were there similar trials with similar outcomes in Canada? Many are surprised to find out the answer is yes. Well, kind of. It was nowhere near the same as you saw elsewhere. Very much a different situation. We have to remember that in Canada during the 17th century, French law was the law. This was still New France, with first and second generation citizens who were governed by people who came over to the colonies from France. Back in France, how witchcraft charges were persecuted were very, very different than in Britain and, by extension, New England. First was the evidence that would be entered into one of those trials. Under French law, if something was deemed impossible in the natural world, it couldn't be considered as credible evidence. This means evidence such as finding a witch's mark on a person, or that you had seen someone flying on a broom, or that they had cursed you in a dream that wouldn't be admissible. Contrast this with how things were handled in New England. A midwife was found guilty of witchcraft and put to death on the evidence that, and I'm paraphrasing a touch here, she had told a patient that if they didn't follow her her advice, they wouldn't heal properly. And then they didn't heal properly and she was accused of witchcraft. Or let's look at perhaps the most famous witchcraft trials in North America, Salem. There, much of the evidence was spectral evidence, basically the testimony of the accusers that they saw the apparition of the person being accused, even in their dreams. The reasoning behind this was that it was the devil doing this, and the devil couldn't use the shape of a person without their permission, so therefore the accused was complicit with the devil. So I now I know everybody's wondering, you know, we're talking about the United States, but this is a podcast about Canadian history. So what about trials that would have been happening in what is now Canada during the same time frame in New France? Well, what happened? Well, we'll take a look at work by Robert Lionel Seguin. He worked over the years and determined that there are around 22 instances of supernatural involvement in cases that went before the courts. The majority of these, though, were a passing reference to other charges. In fact, most of them came nowhere near what would be considered a witchcraft trial like there was in New England. In his article, Witchcraft in New France in the 17th Century, written back in the winter of 1977, Jonathan L. Pearl detailed one of the cases that became before a seigneurial court in Montreal in 1658. Quote, A disappointed suitor named Besnard cast a spell on his former sweetheart by tying of ritual knots in a string. This spell was a traditional way of causing impotence in men, 
It was widely practiced in France and greatly feared. The whole area of human sexuality and fertility was a special target for diabolical spells. Since failure to carry out the sexual act or to conceive was perceived as very abnormal and quite mysterious, it was quickly ascribed to supernatural interference. In this case, the newlyweds, frightened at hearing of the spell, found it impossible to consummate their marriage and accused Besnard of causing perpetual impotence caused by Melifis. This court dissolved the marriage and found Besnard guilty. He was fined 700 pounds and banished from Montreal. His accusers quickly married other partners. The ex-husband eventually fathered 14 children and the ex-wife bore 11, which of course confirmed in their minds that their earlier problems had been caused by the devil and his earthly agent, Besnard. Unquote. Now, there are some records of the testimony from this trial, which shows in a way the attitude towards witchcraft in New France. At one point, Besnard was asked if he told the wife he would remove the spell if she slept with him while her husband was away. Besnard stated in court, quote, Yes, I did say that, but not because I did the magic. It was only because I wanted to enjoy her. Unquote. This is perhaps one of the biggest differences in terms of the sentence uh, between New France and New England. When a person was sentenced to death under French law, no matter the charge, they could appeal their sentence. Most people who were found guilty of witchcraft or blasphemy would be sentenced to banishment instead of death. This was to avoid the cost of an appeal, which the magistrates had to cover in a death sentence, not the accused. This doesn't mean that there weren't executions for cases involving witchcraft in New France. Let's look at the case of a miller accused of causing the demonic possession of 16-year-old Barb Halle. It started with a report of voices in the air and a fiery canoe in the sky. This report came from Marie de la Incarnation, an Ursuline nun. These events started shortly after the arrival of new colonists in 1660. Among the new arrivals were Halle and a man named Daniel Viol. We will note that Viol was a Protestant who had converted to Catholicism during the voyage to New France, and this is very important to the rest of the case. On this voyage, Buell tried his best to hook up with the teenager, and she refused him the whole way. Once they got to New France, Buell went to Beauport near Quebec. Halle went on to work as a servant in a home. By December, that home became the scene of a number of strange events. Jesuit missionary Paul Raguignon wrote, quote, The girl's home was so infested that stones were flying from all sides, thrown by invisible hands hurting no one, though they flew through 20 persons or so, with a noise and a force as great as if they had been launched by a mighty arm." Unquote. Shortly afterwards, the girl started to have visions of demons, and these demons started to possess her, speaking through her. The Bishop of New France, Francois de Laval, was called in. He ordered the local priest to perform an exorcism, which didn't work. Then Laval himself tried to perform an exorcism. Still no success. Halle was taken to the only hospital in New France, l'Hôtel Dieu de Québec. There, she would be seen by Mother Catherine de Saint-Augustine. She was considered the holiest woman in New France and was considered to be somewhat of an expert in dealing with demons. She would do what she could to alleviate the suffering of the poor teenager. While all of this was happening, more was learned about Daniel Viol. In a rare instance of spectral evidence being cited in a case in New France, after Halle stated of the visions that she was having, one of them included Vuel, he was arrested. Witchcraft, though, was not the only reason why Vuel had been arrested. Remember how we mentioned he had converted to Catholicism on the voyage? Turns out this was just so he would have been able to cross over and settle in New France. Rules had been put in place decades earlier to prevent Huguenots, who were Protestants, from emigrating to New France. After arriving in New France, Vuel had relapsed back to Protestantism, a crime which was punishable by death. Then there was an issue about alcohol. In New France, people were banned from providing liquor to the indigenous people of the area. This was a rule strictly enforced by the government. Turns out Vuel was accused of selling liquor to the indigenous people in the area. Yeah, things weren't looking too good for him. Vuel would be executed by being shot and killed in 1661 in Quebec City. The exact reason for his execution 
isn't known, and it is still a subject of debate amongst historians. He did face at least two charges that could have resulted in execution, and witchcraft wasn't one of them. So what happened to Halle? Well, her possession continued. In 1662, Catherine de Saint Augustine had her sewn into a bag, and this appeared to have worked. Halle recovered her health, and she would end up getting married and lived to the age of 52. There was another high-profile case involving witchcraft in 1682, this time in Montreal. A tavern keeper, Anne Lamarck, would be charged with adultery, promiscuity, running a brothel, and witchcraft. And the whole trial was a pretty sordid affair for 17th century. In fact, some of the testimony could be considered even sordid for today. Witnesses testified that she refused to take communion at Easter and had a spell book. She was also accused of using spells to bring the men of Montreal to her tavern where she would sleep with them. She was also accused of insulting the parish priest, Father Etienne Guillaume, saying he wasn't worth to say mass and that she had threatened to beat him like a dog. Now, insults towards the priest were actually kind of expected from the sounds of things. Reports are he was the type of priest who would rebuke parishioners from the pulpit. He was even called by an army officer who was a Montreal Baron Louis Armand de La Hontan, a misanthropic bigot who found everything to be scandalous about mortal sin. The trial would stretch on for weeks. Almost 40 witnesses called to the stands. But in the end, the civil authority found her to be not guilty. Turns out one of the key reasons for the lack of witchcraft trials in New France compared to places like New England was the fact that society was more secular. Historian Leslie Choquette wrote, quote, Neither the common folk nor the colony's leaders were particularly inclined to rigorous devotion. On the contrary, a measure of popular indifference was evident in prescribed behavior or even outright anti-clericalism. And a modern mentality was often visible among the administrative elite. Unquote. To simply put it, the people of New France were more enlightened. There was another case that was heard in Montreal in the 1680s that had a similar outcome. Now, this one involved more of a blasphemy charge, which was closely associated with witchcraft in those days. And the case was against a Jean Boudour, a merchant in the community. He was charged after he had set up a servant who had passed out drunk during a dinner party in a manner similar to being crucified. And then the servant was awoken by Boudour, who threw a bucket of cold water on him to make it seem like he was resurrecting him, just like Christ had arisen after his crucifixion. Now, this upset many of the people, and they voiced their complaint to the judiciary. But like Lamarck, he was found not guilty. While the fear of witchcraft died in New England over the years, there were still a few more cases which popped up from time to time in New France. There was a case that happened in Bobassin, Acadie in 1684. In this one, the record shows that a man named Jean Campniard was tried for witchcraft after the death of his employer. The death was caused after Campniard had blown a powder into his boss's eyes. Now, I had actually stumbled across this tale while researching this week's episode and found it on a blog called Unwritten Histories. And this particular blog post, written by Stephanie Pettigrew, gave me the lead on a few of these tales. And I can't finish off this episode without giving a shout out. Back to the story of Camp and Yard, there was a humorous exchange during the trial, which could only be quoted verbatim from Pettigrew's blog post. Quote, the witness states that he saw the accused spread mysterious seeds into a marsh while reciting an incantation, and the next fall he had a terrible crop. And Camp and Yard replied, he doesn't need magic to be a terrible farmer. Unquote. Now, Perhaps the most famous case of a witch in New France, or Quebec, was the story of marie joseph de Carriveau. Her story has become a legend in Quebec. However, she was never accused during her lifetime, really, of being a witch. Her whole story is a tragic one, as is the legend that developed in the years following. marie joseph de was born in 1733 in saint villiers New France, a community that is just upstream from Quebec City along the St. Lawrence River. Of the 11 children that her parents had, she was the only one to survive childhood. She would be married at the age of 16 to a 23-year-old farmer named Charles Bouchard. They would have three children, two daughters and a son, before he passed away in 1760. 
She would remarry 15 months later to another farmer, Louis Etienne Daudier. In January of 1763, Daudier was found dead in the barn with multiple head wounds. Official cause of death was reported as kick to the head from a horse as the wounds were very similar to that. This didn't deter the community from gossiping though. After all, this was a woman who had two husbands die within a span of just a few years. The rumors would get to the British authorities who were occupying Quebec as part of the Seven Years' War, and they would take the matter up, starting an inquiry on March 29, 1763. Marie Josephte, along with her father, were charged with the murder of Dodier. Deciding their fate was a military tribunal of 12 English officers. A number of people in the community testified against the accused, and the case, which ended on April 9th, found the two guilty. Joseph Corvo was sentenced to death for the murder of Dodier, while Marie Josephte was convicted of being an accomplice to the murder, was to be lashed 60 times and branded with the letter M on her hand. After he was condemned, her father changed his story and stated he was just the accomplice after the fact and that his daughter was the one who had killed Dodier. A second trial was held, and at this second trial, Marie Josephte confessed to murdering her husband while he slept with a hatchet, two blows to the head. She was sentenced to be hung, with her body to be suspended in a gibbet afterwards. She was executed just three days later, and then her body was placed into the gibbet, which hung at the crossroads of Lausanne and Bienville, which is today the intersection of Saint-Joseph Street and De Lentin Boulevard. The body remained suspended in the gibbet until May 25th, when the residents of the area asked that it be taken down. The gibbet was removed, and Marie Josephte was buried in the iron cage of the gibbet in the cemetery of Saint Joseph de la Pointe Levis. The gibbet would be dug up in 1851, and that is really when the legends began to grow about Corriveau. The gossip about her execution, how her first husband had died, then how her second husband had died shortly after, led to all sorts of legends. The story started with tales about how she was a witch, and then how her ghost still haunts that intersection. In fact, there are still tales that her ghost still haunts that intersection to this day. And how she poisoned her first husband. The number of husbands that she had grew as well, to as many as seven, all killed by Le Corriveau. The stories began to grow more and more with each author, playwright, and songwriter who touched the story, adding more and more until it became near impossible to separate the truth from the legend of Corriveau. To this date, La Corriveau brings up images of a witch or even a supernatural being who to this day haunts the area in which she died. Her tale is one of sorrow and heartbreak, and must, one must wonder how true her confession was or if she was simply confessing so that her father wouldn't have to be the one executed for the death of her husband, given that the record had already shown his death wasn't necessarily by human hand. The death of Corriveau gave rise to a legend in the years that followed, but it wasn't the end of stories of witches and witchcraft trials in Canada. In fact, the last charges surrounding witchcraft in Canada are actually from this century. Seriously. In 2018, Dory Medina Stevenson of Milton, Ontario was arrested under a little-known part of the Criminal Code of Canada. A week later, another woman claiming to be a psychic in Toronto, Samantha Stevenson, was arrested in a similar investigation. No word as to whether or not these two women were related, though. This section of the Criminal Code, which has since been repealed, was that they were charged with Section 365. And that made it illegal in Canada to fraudulently pretend to exercise or to use any kind of witchcraft, sorcery, enchantment, or conjuration. In fact, there were five people charged under Section 365 since the turn of the century before it was repealed. Uh, I know that history tends to look at things that happened more than 20 years ago, and technically these would count as current events in the academic approach to history, but it is pretty relevant to the episode, so that's why I figured I would bring it up. The section was repealed in 2018, just weeks after the charges were laid against the two Stevensons. So there we have it, a quick look at witchcraft and the law in the history of Canada. I know there's much more to this topic, and perhaps we will pay a visit to it again in the coming months, maybe in October. <laughs>
Coming up on Sunday, we will be continuing our look at the War of 1612 and talking about three events that all happened in a span of six weeks. The Battle of Lake Erie, the Battle of the Thames, and the Battle of Chateaugue. We will also take a closer look at the life of Tecumseh. And next Wednesday, we will take our first true look at a legend about things that went bump in the night, the Great Amherst Mystery, and discuss whether the events were faked or there really was a poltergeist in a small Nova Scotia town. Look for us on Patreon. Join our community where you will get early ad-free access to our podcast. You will also get access to weekly live discussions on the history of Canada. Like and follow us on social media. This includes Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. Every day we bring you our This Date in Canadian History feature plus a lot more. Check out our YouTube and become a subscriber. We will be bringing more and more video content in the coming weeks. Speaking of video content, we are also working on a Kickstarter for our documentary series that tells some of the stories of Canada that are better told visually rather than just by audio. That Kickstarter goes live today. And follow along the podcast on your favorite platform. We bring you two episodes a week. One is Canadian History After Dark, and the other is our ongoing anthology series that looks at various events from Canadian history that may not be as well-known nationwide as they are regionally. Thank you for listening to Canadian History After Dark.